I'm Chloe, and today I'm going to teach you how to make one hell of a histogram on ggplot. Um, this is what your final graph is going to be looking like. Um, as you can see, it's essentially, um, we're going to be working with grid range, we're going to be working with histograms. As the final product, let's do it. Okay, so, first thing we're going to do is that we are going to load our packages, mainly ggplot is today what we're going to be working with. Um, and also I'm loading this data, data sets. Uh, so let's look at what this beavers is about. It's about two beavers, <laughs> unsurprisingly. Um, and it kind of looks at the, we've got the day, the time, the temperature, so pretty basic things. Um, and so if we kind of click on our beavers, we see we've got beaver one, and then we've got beaver two. Um, activity is a binomial, temperature is, seems to be in C, time is 24 hour clock, and the day must be the day of the year, like the 307th the day of the year. Great. Um, so if I first just kind of look at one of the data sets, just what I thought would be logical would be looking at when they're active with respect to time, maybe circadian rhythms is something that's interesting to look at. And the first thing we see here is that this beaver, beaver 1, does not seem to be very active, right? There's only like six time points within the entire day that this dude is seen moving around. So what, what, what's that about? You know, maybe this other beaver is really active. So let's look at the two. But, you know, here's some big drama is that these are two different files. What do we do? Well, friends, let me tell you, this is when we're going to take care of an R bind. So we're going to be binding uh, the rows. You can also do a C bind. <clears throat> and so I'm going to name it beavers. And I'm R binding beaver 1 and beaver 2. So let's do that. Oops. Yes. Um, and so as you can see, uh, it's got four variables. And now it's got all of the observations. Um, one very important thing to do when you're R binding or C binding is that the the rows need to match up, the, the, the column names need to be identical. If they're not, then the computer's like, what are you talking about? We look at this new beavers data frame and it looks great, but the whole problem is that I bound all of them, all the rows, but I don't know who's who anymore. Who's beaver one? Who's beaver two? I don't know. So I'm going to make a new column. I'm going to call it name. And I'm going to make beaver one's name, I'm going to call him Ricky, because I think that's a pretty funny name for a beaver. And so now, within beaver one, you can see, oh, his name is Ricky. This is all Ricky, right? And so then, I'm going to name beaver two, Steve, because that also seems like a great name for a beaver. So now, we're going to R bind again, but now it's going to have this name category. So now we're going to know... Oh, there we go, that's Ricky, and this is Steve. So this is a way to be able to tell our data apart. Great, so now we're just going to be working with the, data, uh, with the beavers data frame. So now that I'm, I'm, I'm curious about when they're active, right? So I'm going to actually subset this data, this beavers data, to only show me the data of when they're active. So something uh, that we haven't talked about before is how to subset. So, as I said, I'm going to be looking at that beavers data frame, which beavers active equals one. So when one is true, so when they are active. So now, uh, also remember that when we, within these square brackets, the first call is the column and the second call is the row. So within the column of activity equaling one, that's what I want. So these uh, subsetting can be a little bit confusing, but once you think of it within the logical steps, it, it starts to clear up a little bit. But it's definitely something I struggled with a lot when I was uh, first starting to, to deal with code. So now we've got our new data frame called active. Here it is. Uh, 68 observations of five variables. Um, and so let's just look at it. Let's just see. And this, my friends, is where the drama starts. So first of all, you can see I colored by name, which is something I go over in the previous thing. So color is just doing the outline. And also if it's within my aesthetics, it's going to be using that variable name. So I've got these two colors. Um, and so I'm just going to change it to fill, color to fill, because I think it's prettier. 
Um, but let's just look at it, right? And when we're looking at this data, these data, it looks like Ricky is like behind the blue, you know, that really here there are six for the red. No, 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 no. Actually here, because of the default setting in the geome histogram, um, this data point is actually one. This bar is from five to six. It is equivalent to one. It is stacked on top of the other one, which can be super misleading if you've never dealt with this before. Um, so let's talk about how to get around that. So the first thing we can do is modify the position. So if we modify the position to equal dodge, bam, great, now um, the bars are right next to each other. If uh, we have the position to equal identity, um, now the bars are superimposed on top of each other instead of being stacked on top of each other. But we run into yet another problem. Uh, here you can see I modify the transparency to 0.5 which if I hadn't have done that, let's just say it was one, um, you, would have lost some, you would have lost Ricky all over again. <laughs> so I changed it to 0.5 to show you that even with the identity, you've got a little problem. And the problem is the order of your variables. So what you can see here is that Ricky, our buddy Rick, is hidden behind Steve. And that's because of the order of the variables, because R comes before S. And that's just how ggplot, it's like, hmm, alphabet, I like that. But we don't want that, right? We want Ricky to shine. We want to know why Ricky's being weird. So, um, let's talk about how to get around that. <laughs> so, what I do, at least, is that I take this active name, right? And I make it as a factor. So remember, before, active was, uh, the name was a character, right? It's a character that we just created out of thin air. We're now going to code it as a factor. Um, I have just factors for me is a way that I can check the levels. And so here we see the levels Ricky and then Steve. So one then follows the other. Um, and so what we want to do is just relevel that. We want, uh, within the active name, we want Steve to come first. And so one really important thing here is that we are saving this relevel as the same factor variable. You could name it as something new if you want to, maybe name with a capital N. Um, but here, for me, at least for this question, we are replacing it, it's fine, and also it's really important to remember that you're saving this within the relevel function as being saved, because before, for a long time, I was releveling, but I wasn't saving the relevel, so it wasn't actually being coded um, in, the, in the graph. So it's important to actually save this relevel as the new order of your, of your variables. Okay, and so now, um, let's try it again and see what happens. Et voila! We have this blue bar, which is now in front of the, the red bar. Um, if we were to do one, you would still see the blue bars because, again, as I mentioned, ggplot is a canvas. It paints one thing on top of the other thing, and now we have changed the order at which the paint is applied. So this is all well and good, but what about faceting? What if we want these two identical plots, but we want Ricky and Steve to be just separate, two different histograms. You could code them by hand and just do two different plots. Um, but also there's this cool trick called facet wrap. And so you can um, facet the data based on the levels of a variable. So let me just, the tilde is like, let's facet based on this variable. That's kind of how I think about it. I realize <laughs> that's maybe not the most logical thing. I think it has to do with how models are coded and the use of the tilde there, but that's something we can get into hopefully in the future. But for this, just a histogram, just think, ooh, names. That's, that's how I think about it. I don't know. So if we facet that wrap based on the name, we have these two levels of this variable, Steve and Ricky, and now this data is, is subsetted uh, right next to each other, the same time frame. There you go. As we've covered in the last one, um, I'm very picky about my colors. I like to have a cute graph. I think it, it's, it counts for a lot. So here we're going to go over some code quite quickly because I already covered it in the previous video. Um, so anyway, just naming my, my legends and telling where I want my legend position to be, all of that is covered previously. Anyway, 
So let's 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 get this side by side graph kind of cued it up. Um, I'm using this palette Dark Two because uh, I think it's cute and kind of goes with the woodsy beaver look. <laughs> And also just notice here, I'm coloring and filling, um, and I'm making sure to keep that color in scale with my palette. So the what you color and what you fill is, is important to distinguish those two. And then finally, I am going to make a cute overlay um, because we had talked about that previously. Um, and I'm also storing the graph names because I wanted to do to put them side by side. And often in, in papers, you get these cool side by side. Um, and this is using this package uh, called Grid Extra. I think it's awesome. Um, and so anyway, yeah. Stay plotty, yo. And stay safe during these times.